Joe Lombardo. I'm the uh, coordinator of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition. Um, UNAC, as probably most people know, um, is a coalition of anti-war groups in the United States. Um, you could find us online at unacpeace.org. Uh, we're also on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, and we are an anti-war coalition that considers ourselves an anti-imperialist coalition. Uh, we focus on the U.S. government, which is our government, but is also the primary imperialist power in the world. Uh, not only does it control financial institutions that control countries all around the world, such as the IMF and the um, World Bank, uh, but and sanctions many, many countries, about 43 right now, if they don't abide by the U.S. wishes, but they have military throughout the world, perhaps in 172 countries was a figure I saw recently. They have about 20 times the number of foreign military bases as all other countries in the world combined. The country with the second highest number of military bases is Britain, our NATO partner. The country with the third highest number of foreign military bases is France, another one of our NATO partners. So the US and NATO are the main military footprint around the world, and this is why we put our focus on them. So I'm going to introduce Scott Ritter now. Um, many times in the past, uh, we've talked about, and you can find it on the UNAC website, the causes of this war in Ukraine. Um, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time reiterating them, but we all know of NATO's moves um, to the border of Russia, even though it said that it would not, the war games on the borders, the uh, nuclear capable missiles that have been put there, the coup that took place in 2014 that brought real right wingers, Nazis, people that, that you know, have swastikas on their jackets. I've seen them march through the streets with, um, uh, with torch lights. I've seen them um, uh, into the government and into the military. The U.S. and NATO helped build up the military from a small military to perhaps one of the strongest in the world. They've armed them. They've trained them. They've attacked the uh, areas that rejected the coup in Donbass and called themselves independent areas. They've attacked them, killing maybe 14,000 people um, in the last eight years. Um, and, uh, and then they started moving again in large numbers and massing on the border of Donbass. And that started the war that we see now and, and prompted Russia, Russia to come in to protect the Russian ethnic people and the Russian speaking people to try to disarm this threat on, on their border and NATO's threat. I'm going to leave it at that without going into a lot of detail and, and, and uh, um, ask some questions uh, for Scott. You know, when events are coming to a head, things happen very quickly. And things have happened very quickly in the past few days and weeks um, uh, in Ukraine. Um, uh, typically, when we do these things, we talk a little bit about the military situation. Um, in Ukraine, but that's almost the least of the situations right now, although we do want to talk about that, and we'll start with that. But the um, partial mobilization, the referenda that have taken place, the recent sabotage of the Nord Stream uh, pipelines and, and the meaning of that, uh, the threats of nuclear war that we've been hearing, the economic fallout, especially in Europe, where I am right now, um, uh, that is is taking place recently. The, uh, in the last couple of days, there's been attacks as uh, caravans of cars have been trying to go back to get into the, the new part of Russia the, that had the referendums. They've been attacked. The U.S. media says it's Russia attacking these people, um, but it's not. It's, it's the Ukraine, just as it was Ukraine that's been attacking a nuclear power plant um, and it's the West that has attacked the, uh, um, the pipelines. So let's start by with some questions uh, for um, uh, Scott and let him uh, fill them out. 
there's let's, let's start with the military situation, if you don't mind, Scott. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the um, uh, um, uh, gains of Ukraine in the Kharkiv region. In the last couple of days, they've been saying things about Lehman. Um, and so what is the actual situation? I know this is something you follow. Maybe you can explain a little bit to us, and then we can get onto those, some of those other, other topics. Sure. Um, I think in order to understand the present, I have to give a quick, um, just a sketch of, uh, of, of the military reality. Um, let's start off by acknowledging from the start that Russia did not declare war on Ukraine. Had Russia declared war on Ukraine, this war would be over. Um, Russia would have gone in doctrinally with uh, forces appropriate to the task of conquering a nation. This was a special military operation uh, that had as its singular focus of effort uh, the liberation of Donbas, uh, two newly independent republics uh, who had joined in a collective security agreement with uh, Russia, uh, and Russia was intervening on their behalf, um, citing Article 51, uh, preemptive collective self-defense to uh, eliminate an imminent threat posed by 60,000 Ukrainian troops that had been armed by NATO, trained by NATO, and dispatched to Eastern Ukraine for the purpose of launching an offensive against Donbas to uh, conquer it. Um, it what, and the reason why I have to bring this up is there are, there seems to be some expectations in the West about Russian capabilities and that Russia hasn't lived up to these expectations. And therefore Russia is somehow a paper tiger. Russia, the Russian military is not as uh, capable as people thought it would be. Um, an analogy I like to use uh, that maybe people can understand is a, a boxing analogy. Um, if you're training for a prize fight and you train you know, in a stance that's left foot forward so that you're jabbing with your left and then you're, you're punching with your right. And you train this whole, your whole time for that. And then at the last second, you decide when you jump into the ring, I'm going to go right foot forward, jab with my right, punch with my left. You, you've literally taken yourself out of the fight. Um, you're not really fighting. This was what Russia did. Russia did not come in with, they didn't, first of all, they never applied the full force of their doctrine. They never organized for this fight in accordance with doctrine. This was a special military operation with very limited objectives and limited application of power. Uh, that doesn't mean that the fighting isn't bloody. That doesn't mean that the Russians haven't suffered setbacks. It doesn't mean that the Ukrainians haven't been slaughtered. They have. The death, the death toll in this fighting has been unreal. But I'm here to tell you that modern large-scale ground combat had the Russians brought to bear the totality of their conventional capabilities the death toll would be much, much, much higher. Um, Russia organized to fight Ukraine. Ukraine had a very considerable military force, 260,000 active duty forces, several hundred thousand reservists. By early summer, Russia had destroyed the Ukrainian military. All of the Soviet era equipment that the Ukrainians possessed at the start of this war, for the most part, was gone. Uh, their military, 260,000 active duty forces had suffered over 60,000 dead, over 40,000 wounded. And let's talk about that for a second. Normally, you'd expect to see two or three times the number wounded than you see dead. Why is it that the Ukrainians are suffering uh, more dead than wounded? Two things. One, the absolute lethality of the modern battlefield. The Russians do have technology that is extremely lethal. Two, the Ukrainians have lost control of the battlefield. They basically are abandoning people on the battlefield who otherwise would have a chance to live, who could be evacuated and provided with medical assistance. Uh, these people are being left on the battlefield. They're dying. In war, we talk about the golden hour. In the United States, that's a big deal. If you get wounded badly, we have the golden hour to medevacue off the battlefield to a surgical unit to, uh, to take care of you. Ukrainians are denied this. Their men are dying. But something happened in, uh, in, in May. And Joe, I think we talked about this. Uh, the decision by NATO to stop sending defensive weaponry, quote unquote, the javelins, the stingers, the light arms, the counter battery radars, and the transition into heavy equipment. The decision by Congress to enact the so-called Lend-Lease 
um, legislation, uh, Public Law 117-128, some $43 billion worth of uh, assistance, um, military and financial, to Ukraine to prop it up and, in effect, together with NATO, to reconstitute the destroyed Ukrainian military. NATO opened up the totality of its space to provide Ukraine with strategic depth that was outside the reach of Russian um, uh, air, air power to, to strike it. So tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops, tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops were, um, were sent to, um, to England, to France, to Germany and elsewhere to be trained and to be equipped with uh, this NATO equipment. These troops started to move into the battlefield sometime in uh, July, August. They were supplemented with thousands of um, highly trained, uh, high, well-organized uh, mercenaries. Um, and on September, they launched a major counteroffensive. Uh, they attacked in Kherson. Um, this attack was repulsed. Many people, including myself, believe that this was a, a diversionary attack designed to fix Russian forces in place and get Russia to commit reserves. Then they attacked with their main attack in Kharkov, where they caught the Russians flat-footed. Um, one of the things that came out of this is that Russia had insufficient resources to the task at hand. That when NATO has poured in nearly $50 billion worth of heavy equipment, uh, they basically changed the game. And that's what we saw in Kharkov. The Russians were forced to withdraw, reconsolidate their defenses, and then reconsider their next moves. The next moves were decisive. One, Putin ordered the partial mobilization of 300,000 uh, Russian reservists. Uh, these 300,000 are currently being organized and trained. One can expect them to start to arrive on the battlefield, at least some elements of them in October, the bulk of them by December. Um, and Russia will act accordingly by having these 300,000 uh, troops available to secure the border. Uh, and to provide strategic depth, Russia will free up around 200, 210,000 frontline combat troops, which it can now organize doctrinally and apply them in combat the way Russia is supposed to fight. This is, you know, Ukraine changed the game, Russia, or changed, you know, altered the game, Russia changed the game altogether. Uh, the other thing Russia did was hold referenda. In these, in the, in the four territories that they controlled, uh, Kherson, Zaporizhia, um, Donetsk, and Lugansk, and just today, uh, Vladimir Putin signed uh, legislation that formally incorporated these territories into Russia. And by making them Russia, um, the, the, this has changed. You know, Ukraine changed the military aspect of it by taking a Ukrainian army that had been trained and equipped by NATO and transforming it into a NATO army. It was manned primarily by Ukrainians. And that's a qualitative um, uh, you know, uh, alteration of the battlefield. Russia responded by, by taking a battlefield that was being fought on Ukrainian soil and transforming it into Russian soil. And um, anybody who attacks Russia from now on will now open themselves up for the full strength of Russia. Now, some people have speculated that this includes nuclear weapons. It does not. Russian nuclear doctrine under no circumstances allows for the employment of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. There is no scenario where Russian nuclear weapons would be used in Ukraine. The Ukrainian government is trying to scare the world into believing this is what Russia is going to do. Um, therefore, they're asking for the NATO nuclear umbrella to be extended over uh, Ukraine. They're asking for assistance in developing their own nuclear deterrent. Um, and they're trying to create a nuclear scare in the West. But Russian nuclear weapons will not be used in Ukraine. Russian nuclear weapons could be used if NATO decided to intervene on behalf of Ukraine to send NATO forces into Ukraine that threatened um, the security of Mother Russia, of these of Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Lugansk. If NATO force forces were to actually penetrate into Russian territory, then Russia would strike with nuclear weapons against NATO. They would strike London, Paris, Berlin, <laughs> no, Brussels, uh, but they wouldn't strike Ukraine. Uh, this is Russian doctrine. People who study Russian nuclear posture know this. Um, where we are right now is that Russia has put NATO in what I call the horns of a dilemma. Um, no matter what NATO does right now, they're going to get impaled. There's no, there's no 
right decision for NATO because they've overcommitted to Ukraine. By committing uh, this, the military resources to the fight, you know, NATO has stripped bare its own arsenal. Uh, nations like Germany, nations like Holland, nations like Canada, even the United States no longer have anything left to give. The United States just passed a $12 billion military um, you know, support package, but this is to build new weapons <laughs> that won't be delivered to Ukraine until 2024. Uh, there will be a Ukraine in 2024, but this is where we're at right now. NATO is overcommitted militarily and politically. Um, and Russia, by basically calling their bluff and going all in, now what is NATO to do? And we found out. Today, uh, Zelensky put in a, uh, a request for uh, accelerated membership into, uh, uh, into NATO. And the NATO Secretary General had to stand up and humiliate himself and say, no, we are not going to let you in. The President of the United States had to say, no, we are not going to let you in. Why? Because they know the stakes. They know that the game has changed. They know that it's no longer about Ukraine, that it's about Mother Russia. And they know that there's no chance for Ukraine to... Uh, to emerge from this intact. It's basically, they've written off Ukraine. They will continue to supply weapons to Ukraine as they can, but you're gonna see the scope and scale of the weapons diminish over time. And I think we're gonna see the Russians launch the kind of offensive that uh, most people thought they were gonna launch when they started this conflict. Um, I had an interesting interview with a, a Russian parliamentarian the other day. And uh, when I asked him how far Russia was gonna go, he said to the border of Poland, uh, that this won't stop until all of Ukraine is captured uh, and that, because that's what's required now to, when the Ukrainian military has been converted to a NATO military and you say that your goal is the demilitarization of all NATO influence in Ukraine, that means you have to destroy the Ukrainian army. When you say denazification, but the Russian government has classified the Zelensky government as a Nazi regime, that means regime change. Uh, and the Russians have said they're not deviating one iota from the goals and objectives set. Now we talked about the military thing, but remember war is just an extension of politics by other means. Uh, there's some other, this war is much bigger than just the fighting on the ground. This war has an economic uh, dimension and a political dimension. You know, this war wasn't supposed to happen. We were supposed to, we being the collective West, were supposed to intimidate Russia, deter Russia by threatening massive sanctions that would cripple the Russian economy. Um, you know, when you, when, you, when you deride a nation and say that it's no, nothing more Russia, it's nothing more than a large gas station uh, disguised as a nation. We've heard that term come from Western politicians. Well, okay, but if you're an automobile that needs that gas station to fuel you, you might not want to cut relations with the gas station. And that's what Europe has done. They, Scott, they I, wonder if we could, uh, I wonder if we could just pick a little bit of some of the things you said. You um, and, and get back to some more of, uh, uh, of the things where I think you were going. But um, you, you did mention the um, uh, partial mobilization. Now that is being decried in the West as a kind of defeat and that people are running from the country because of it. Um, do you think that shows some weakness? Do you think, uh, do you have any sense of of what that means in Russia and, and how, how it is going, or, um, or do, you, have you, do you hear anything other than what people hear on the U.S. and Western propaganda? Well, first of all, the, the, I don't think people in the West understand uh, the Russian reserve system and uh, the concept of, of mobilization partial or general. Um, it's not like the West. They don't have full-time reserves. Um, that drill every week, uh, every month, and uh, you know every year, uh, two weeks. Uh, their reserve system is basically once you leave the military, you register, um, and that's it. Um, sometimes they have a handful of people that serve as cadres uh, of the of the various reserve units, but it's not it's not like uh, like in the West. So when we see the Russians go through this process of calling up people, to us it seems chaotic. Uh, to us, it, it seems less than efficient, not nearly as efficient as the American system, but it's not the American system. It's the Russian system. And a key aspect to this, you know, people talk about the, the number of people who have fled, and there's no doubt that a large number of people have fled to Georgia, to Kazakhstan, Armenia, and elsewhere. Um, you know, Russia is not a dictatorship. Everybody talks about Putin as if he's a dictator. Uh, 
it's a it's a democracy. It's not a Western style Jeffersonian democracy. First of all, it's a democracy that's been under siege from the CIA and MI6, who's been buying off political opponents, oh, and that alone undermines uh, democratic institutions. Um, but it's a it's a democracy nonetheless. And when Putin runs for election, you know he he wins between sixty percent, seventy percent of the vote. You know, dictators usually win ninety nine point nine nine percent of the vote. But think about it for a second. If somebody as strong as Putin is only getting 60 or 70 percent of the vote, that means 30 to 40 percent of Russia doesn't support him. And of that 30 to 40 percent, you could probably say 15 to 20 percent are strongly anti of people who are vehemently opposed to his government and what it's doing. And in a nation of 150 million, if you have 10 percent, that's 15 million. If you have 20 percent, that's 30 million people who are opposed to Putin. So we have 30 million people who are strongly opposed to Putin, and they're saying about 220,000 people have fled Russia. Um, I think statistically we have to acknowledge that that is nothing. That is a drop in the bucket, uh, and it's meaningless. And frankly, most Russians right now look at those people and bid them a fond farewell. What's happening right now in Russia is a mobilization not of just 300,000 people, it's a mobilization of the nation. There is an awakening of patriotism inside Russia today that hasn't been seen since the Great Patriotic War. We are seeing entire towns, villages coming out and bidding their men farewell, sending them off to battle, wishing them to come home and victorious. Um, you know, mothers are sending their sons, wives are sending their husbands. Uh, this is, you know, it, it's something that we haven't experienced here in the United States. We haven't experienced anything like it. We don't understand it. Is this a sign of weakness? Oh, no. This is a sign of Russia's strength. And the world needs to understand that what's about to happen is that Russia is mobilizing the nation. The nation is now committed not just to a special military operation, but to total victory over Ukraine. Yeah, they, they, you know, in the United States, you don't see that. Got to go to the Telegram channels or some of the other Russian media that's been censored here. And you start seeing how the people cheering people when they're leaving on the buses and so forth. You yeah. don't see any of that. And to put it in a little context, you know, when we fought the Iraq war, we had reservists too. We had National Guard. We had re reserve army. Um, we had our reservists going in there. And I, I am someone who's, who was an anti-war activist during the Vietnam War. I remember the people that tried to get out of the draft during the Vietnam War. 30,000 of them went to Canada. But most of the people that tr tried to get out of the draft or resisted the draft didn't go to Canada. Um, a lot stayed, a lot fought it, a lot went to jail. They jailed people for up to five years who were trying to avoid the draft. And millions of us were in the streets protesting that war. Um, it's so hypocritical to see the Western media, you know, uh, with none of that in its memory and, and criticizing uh, what's going on there. Well, Russia. let me just uh, say one more thing about the, the people leaving. Um, the vast majority of the people leaving are not subjected to recall. These are people who didn't serve in the military. These are people who don't have the skill sets required. These are simply anti-Putin activists who are either trying to make a political point or are concerned about a potential future mobilization. Um, but the reality is, you know, this isn't like during Vietnam when somebody got their draft notice and said, I'm, I'm going to dodge the draft or I'm going to, I mean, that's what we call it, dodge, draft dodgers. These aren't draft dodgers. These are just cowards. I, I, I don't mean that. I, you know, a draft dodger at least uh, had their own form of courage. They were they were making a moral stance. They were take they were taking great risk. They put themselves at risk of imprisonment, of losing their family, et cetera. The people that are running away right now are risking. They're literally running away from nothing. Nobody's trying to bring them into the military. Nobody's trying to do anything. They aren't receiving notices. Uh, the people who are receiving the notices are almost all going to the mobilization centers, and it's not just that. The mobilization centers are overwhelmed by people who didn't get notices. We said, hey, I just got out of the military last year. Where's my notice? Why aren't you sending me? And uh, they're overwhelmed by these numbers. Uh, and, and, you know, so they, they need, they're actually seeking additional funding to, ac to accommodate these, uh, these volunteers. So we don't understand what's going on. Again, 
I don't mean to denigrate anybody who has a moral, uh, you know, who morally is opposed to war. I respect that. I respect. I wish most. I wish more people were morally opposed. To war. Um, but you know, the, the the people that are fleeing Russia right now aren't anti-war activists. They're they're basically pro-Western liberals who are angry with Putin and are frustrated with this and are 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 leaving uh, for a political statement. This isn't the, about running away because they don't want to be drafted. They're not going to be drafted. No one's trying to draft them. They're running away because they uh, they have a problem with Putin. And again, that reflects the democratic nature of Russia, that there is, a, there, there is a viable opposition. But when you run away, you sort of run away from participatory uh, politics as well. And uh, I think these people are, are neutralizing themselves in the future because the Russia they're going to return to, if they ever are allowed to return, is not going to be very sympathetic. I guess another thing, you, you raised the question again of nuclear war, which is being circulated here, as if Putin had threatened nuclear war, but nothing is further from the truth. I mean, I listened to every word of his speech a couple of times, actually, and what he did say is, if others are threatening us with nuclear war, you must understand that we have nuclear weapons too, and we will respond. Yeah. But taking that, they turn it on its head and say that he's threatening. Now, I'm in, in Britain right now, and uh, we all should know that the present prime minister of Britain is a woman named Liz Truss, and she has threatened nuclear war against Russia. She was asked specifically if she would be willing to push the button for nuclear war, and she said yes, she would. And the, the commentator was so taken back that he had to ask her again. So she emphatically said, yes, I would. And what Russia has been saying, and, and now even what the US government has been saying is they've been giving um, private warnings to Russia, as well as now a few public warnings. And so this is very clearly what Russia um, has been responding to, but they turn it on its head and, and say, it is Russia that is threatening. But here's the is that your understanding also? No, it is. But let me let me let me go a little bit further on this uh, and and talk about just how dangerous these warnings are. Um, not because they're warnings, but the nature of the warnings. Both Russia and the United States have published their their nuclear posture, and Russia is adamant. There's only two circumstances under which they would ever use nuclear weapons. First is if they are being attacked with nuclear weapons, they will respond. The second is if the the security of the state is put at risk. And that is, if somebody's attacking the state itself, then they and attacking it in a way that um, causes Russia perhaps to lose something like Kherson or, or Zaporizhia, uh, then Russia would use could use nuclear weapons to resolve that situation. Um, the West is under the impression that Russia is considering the use of tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And every Russian I've ever spoken to has just said, that's just ridiculous. We would never use nuclear weapons against Ukraine. There's no reason for us to use nuclear weapons against Ukraine. Um, but here's the deal. The, because the West is considering it, the West is coming back to Russia. And the, um, the warnings that are being given by um, Jake Sullivan and you know, Biden and company, they, according to Newsweek um, and other sources, this isn't a threat that if you use nuclear weapons against Ukraine, we will hit you with nuclear weapons. See, that would give Ukraine the equivalent of a nuclear umbrella. Um, and nobody's going to extend a nuclear umbrella to Ukraine. What we're saying is, if you attack Ukraine with nuclear weapons, we will hit you in a non-nuclear fashion that will result in catastrophic losses for you. Meaning, you will lose the Black Sea Fleet, you will lose the bridge over Kherson, uh, connecting Kerch with southern Russia. You, we would attack Kremlin. There's even talk about a decapitation attack against uh, Putin himself. I mean, don't they understand what that would be? But so they've said that. But here's the danger: rather than scaring the Russians, this has actually engendered a debate inside Russia where they're saying the West is afraid to use nuclear weapons against us because of our strategic nuclear capability. Even you know. And, 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 and the Russians have extended that saying, well, then maybe we could strike NATO with nuclear weapons and the West, is, the United States won't use its strategic nuclear power to, to re react. So the Russians, first of all, there's a big misread on the part of the West. But 
But now there's a misread on the part of Russia. And both sides are misrepresenting doctrine, misunderstanding the doctrine. And with these high tensions, you never know what could happen. I, I am, I, if you had asked me last night, I would have said that we are marching straight to hell, that we're going, we're going to hit, hit the nuclear abyss sooner rather than later. Having watched NATO back down, I'm a little bit more relaxed because, uh, I, you know, I was concerned that NATO might overreact to the, um, the, the annexation or absorption of those four territories into Russia. But it's clear NATO doesn't have um, the stomach for this. Uh, Stoltenberg said, we are not going to bring Ukraine into NATO. Um, and basically, we're not sending NATO troops into, into Ukraine. So they're going to, they're, I, I think we can avoid the issue of, um, you know, the Russian uh, nuclear doctrine being tested by NATO threatening the uh, security of, uh, of Mother Russia. But nonetheless, we have both sides misunderstanding one another because, one, we've introduced nuclear weapons uh, in, into the discussion. What happened to that statement that was signed earlier in the year by all five uh, permanent nuclear powers that nuclear war cannot be won, therefore it should never be fought? That seemed to be thrown away instantly by both the United States and, to a lesser extent, Russia. Mainly Russia reacting to the overreaction of the West for Russia simply stating its doctrine. But it's a very, very dangerous situation. Very dangerous. And it's going to be tested more because I believe that Russia is on the cusp of finishing this fight. And they're going to finish it dramatically, they're going to finish it decisively, and they're going to finish it in a manner which eliminates Ukraine as a viable nation state. Um, how will NATO respond to that is, is, the, is the big question. Um, I think the answer is they have, they, they've got nothing, because literally NATO has nothing, but one never knows. So we still live with the threat of a potential of this conflict spinning out of control and going nuclear. Yeah, well, I hope you're right. I hope there's, <laughs> we all hope, the world hopes that there's no nuclear conflagration. But I've lived through the um, Cuban Missile Crisis, and I remember that. And I, to me, it seems like we are in a more dangerous position right now uh, than we were even, even back then. But let's go on to, you mentioned the referenda. Uh, let's go on to the referenda. What, uh, four sections of Ukraine are now going to, are now part of Russia. I mean, they still, I think there's some technical stuff that has to be voted on by the um, Parliament uh, lawmakers and, uh, yeah. in, in Russia and, and so forth. But it's pretty clear that that's where it is. We're also seeing a very interesting phenomenon. Actually, we've been seeing it for a little while. It seems that there are a number of people from the Ukraine side of this fight who are going over to the new Russian territory. I mean, uh, even um, uh, um, CNN News did a broadcast about this a couple of weeks ago. I have it on my Facebook page if people would, would like to see that, where they, they saw these large caravans of cars going over to, um, to the Russian side. And they tried to interview people and they said, oh, I'm just going to take someone back. But they all had you know, bags on top of their cars and their cars were filled with all their belongings. Um, but now uh, two of these caravans in the last two days apparently have been bombed uh, going back to Russia. Uh, going, uh, people seem to, that's where they want to be right now. Of course, they blamed it on Russia, which is as stupid as blaming, you know, they, they bomb the people that, that are coming to their side uh, just like they would bomb the nuclear power plant that they control or or bomb the their own um, uh, 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 sabotage the their own uh, pipeline you know it, it doesn't make any sense we've learned through this propaganda regime in the united states and europe to stand logic on its head to to just say things that don't don't make any sense but what about these referendum were they real um, uh, was it a, a smart move on the part of, of Russia? Uh, where does it, it leave things in terms of uh, the military situation and, and, and the general political situation right now? I mean, the first question is, were they real? Yes, they're real. They're real. They're as real as it gets. They happened. Um, do they meet all of the criteria set forth under international law? Uh, for you know self-determination 
Well, one of the big problems is that uh, they're being conducted during a time of conflict. And uh, one could make the argument that um, the, the side that occupies the territory has the advantage that, uh, and, and you could say this in Kherson. Kherson, uh, you know, 87% of the, uh, of the population uh, participated in the, uh, in, in, or voted in favor of the, of the 87% of the people voting voted in favor of this. Uh, but that tells you that 13% of the people who voted voted against. And I would imagine that if all of the residents of Kherson, um, the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who fled, um, had a chance to participate, that the, the, the numbers wouldn't be quite as impressive. So, you know, there is a, a case to be made that the uh, legitimacy of these uh, referenda were hindered by um, the, the war. And, uh, and, and I agree with that, but understand that um, the reason why these referenda were held is because of the war, um, that the, the, the Russia was changing the game. Uh, you know, NATO intervened on the side of Ukraine, transforming Ukraine into a proxy of NATO and changing the nature of the conflict. And uh, Russia, in order to respond to that, uh, needed to change the, the entire game. And they did so by turning Ukrainian territory into, into mother and Russia. Um, these territories are part of Russia now. Once, uh, once the Duma votes on it, turns it over to the Federal Assembly, and they send it back to the president, um, this will be permanent forever. They're never going back to Ukraine ever, ever, ever again. Um, so that makes it about as real as it gets. Uh, <laughs> I think Ukraine ne needs to wake up. They lost 20% of their territory. If this war continues, I can pretty much guarantee there's four more Ukrainian oblasts or provinces that'll go over to Russia, Odessa, um, Nikolaev, Nepepetrovsk, Kharkov will all have majority Russian populations and they will, they will be absorbed. So that's the end of the con. That Russia is not just taking 20% right now. And this is done. They'll end up taking, you know, closer to 40% of, of Ukrainian territory and, and call it Novoya Russia and it'll be uh, Russian. Why are these refugees uh, coming to Russia? There's a couple of reasons. One, um, Many of them have pro-Russian sympathies and they're actually fleeing for their lives. Uh, some, you know, when, when the Ukrainians retook Izium, um, a major city in the Kharkov area that had been under Russian occupation since virtually the beginning of the special military operation, um, the, they, they had, people went around and painted Zs on the houses of people that were deemed to be Russian collaborators. And then the Russian security or the Ukrainian security forces came in and horrific crimes have been committed. People have been pulled out, shot on the spot, taken out in the woods, shot, arrested, tortured, et cetera. And people just don't want to live under that fear. And so people are fleeing that. The other thing is the Ukrainian government is increasingly dysfunctional, meaning that uh, pensions aren't being paid. Uh, inter <laughs> gas lines are being shut off. There's no power. There's no running water. There's no this. Um, and, they, and these people want to go to the territories where the Russians are actually taking care of people. You know, when the Russians occupy a territory, what the, they come in and they, they bring it under Russian administration, which means now they make available health care, they make care, available pension plans, they bring in banking institutions, they try to bring running water, gas, uh, everything, and, and lock it into the Russian system. And there's a lot of people looking around in Ukraine going, this is a hellhole, over there life is better. And if you're a, a father and a mother with kids, do you really want to leave your family here or are you going to flee to a better life? And yes, life in Russia is a better life by an order of magnitude over the life that's in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine. So these people are fleeing for any number of reasons, but they're fleeing for real. Uh, and it's an embarrassment to the, uh, to the Ukrainian government, which is why the Ukrainian military is, is shelling them in an effort to deter this kind of uh, a flight. Um, but it's, it's real. Um, it's a huge moment. You, you won't, you know, there, there's not a Russian today who wasn't in tears over what happened. I mean, again, we in the West don't understand it, but the, the, the territories that have been incorporated have always been in the minds and the psyche of the Russian people, Russia, part of the Russian nation, the Donbass, you know, isn't Ukrainian, it's Russian. And the, and they, the people who live there view themselves as Russia, and the Russians view them as Russia. The same thing with Kherson, Zaporizhia. Um, and it, when, 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 when Putin says, welcome home, he means it. And they 
and it, it, it impacts them. And again, in the West, we don't get it. We don't understand what's going on. This is a deeply emotional moment for Russians, hugely emotional. These referenda are as real as it gets. They're irreversible. We can sit here in the West and say, we will never recognize Russia doesn't care. I would also say that uh, I think the Western opinion on these referenda might change over the course of the winter time when, <laughs> when their society collapses and one of the conditions of Russia providing um, you know, future potential energy to help the rebirth of Europe is recognition of Crimea and, uh, and, and, and the territories that have been um, uh, absorbed. I mean, it's sad. It's sad to see a nation be uh, torn apart like Ukraine. It didn't have to happen. We've had this discussion before. This is a war that did not have to happen, and Russia did everything possible to make it not happen. But once it's happened, Russia is going to terminate this conflict on its terms alone. Any notion that there's going to be a negotiated settlement is absurd. It's unconditional surrender. Russia has set the terms. The terms are extreme. Demilitarization, the total annihilation of the Ukrainian military, either by force or voluntary dismantlement, and denazification means regime change. Zelensky and his government are out. The far right-wing parties are out. And um, a new constitution is, is written and a pro-Russian government will be installed. Yeah, but it also has to be said that Russia has tried several times for negotiations. First of all, yeah. be, before the February conflict or twice they had um, uh, accords for stopping the war in Donbass, which uh, uh, Ukraine, and I think under the behest of the West, uh, specifically Britain and the United States, refused to abide by. But even since February, there's been two meetings that perhaps have brought about negotiated deals, um, one which uh, took place in Belarus, and people thought, well, maybe there was a deal there. And all of a sudden, not only did Ukraine withdraw from anything and withdraw from negotiations, but one of their negotiators found himself dead. You know, they, they probably had, did the wrong thing and said, yeah, well, it'd be good to stop this war. And then, of course, the other one in, in Turkey, which looked like there was uh, some agreements. And uh, again, probably on the behest of the United States and, and the West, uh, they withdrew from those. So, and again, in his speech, um, a recent speech, uh, Putin said again, we will negotiate. Yeah. But I think he does it understanding that the West has no intention of negotiating um, at this point. And uh, he, there, the, there's only going to be one, one solution at, at this particular time. Uh, now, <laughs> it seems this explosion of the Nordstrom pipeline has escalated this war to a new and dangerous level. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Of course, it's being said that Russia did it. You know, it's like Russia blew up its own property and its own future possibility of making money by selling its gas. It shot itself in its foot again, I guess, just because uh, there are evil people that do things like that. I don't know, but that's what they try. What's your thoughts on what happened there? Well, let's start first and foremost with first principles. Russia is the largest um, exporter of um, energy in the world. Um, it has an extremely well-developed um, oil and gas industry, um, both in terms of the extraction and then the the, the shipment. The uh, pipelines are their thing. It's their lifeline. It's their you know that's their lifeblood. Uh, nations that invest heavily into uh, energy. Um, they have an appreciation for energy security and an aspect of energy security is that you do not engage in actions that destroy infrastructure because infrastructure is very expensive. Um, and, you know, this is just a, a just a given that you, you avoid anything that results in destroyed pipelines and, um, and things of that nature. So the idea that the world's largest producer of uh, energy who is tied to the European market or in one, you know, is, is, in, even though Europe has sanctioned it, uh, wants to get back to it, um, that Russia would shoot itself in the foot by blowing up its own infrastructure is an absurdity and extreme. Uh, it's just stupid. Moreover, we don't have Vladimir Putin committing to, um, to a, a statement on uh, national TV that, uh, you know, 
if X and X happens, Nord Stream 2 will, will be shut down. It'll go away. Um, trying to kick this dog into submission, but it's not working. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the fact is we do have President Biden. Uh, the United States have been trying to shut down Nord Stream 2 for forever since its inception. And Biden made the specific threat. If, if Russian tanks cross into Ukraine, Nord Stream 2 will, be, will go away, be shut down. Um, I think we have to take him as, at his word. And there's other, you know, there's, there's other circumstantial evidence behind this. The, you know, large scale U.S. naval exercises in the exact vicinity of the uh, attacks in July. Uh, in September, early September, we had U.S. Uh, helicopters flying over the exact same area. A lot of U.S. military attention and interest in this specific zone where these explosions took place. Um, now, this is part and parcel of, you know, America has a policy of divorcing Germany and Europe from Russian gas. That's been our policy since the Cold War. Um, and we attempted to achieve this policy by this massive sanctioning of Russia that took place um, after the Russians initiated their special military operation. And the, the problem is it didn't work. <laughs> it backfired on Europe, all of Europe. I mean, it, you're, you're there, you're, you're seeing it firsthand. It's just uh, the absolute devastation that's taking place and it's only going to get worse. In Germany, um, you know, the German government of, uh, of Schultz, you know, committed to supporting the American policy, not only in sanctioning Russia, but shutting down uh, Nord Stream 2 initially, and then, um, you know, participating in sanctions that led to the shutting down of Nord Stream Run through a lack of maintenance. The German people are in the, were in the streets uh, last week. They were in the streets and in large numbers, and they were demanding that Nord Stream 2 be opened up. They were demanding it. They were telling their government, we demand that you do this. And it's not even cold yet. Um, <laughs> so these demonstrations were going to get out of control. This is why the Germans were talking about deploying the military to the streets uh, in, in October. I mean, Germany's gonna put their troops in the streets because they fear mass protest because of the uh, implications of these sanctions. I oftentimes wonder if the Germans have read um, you know, Nicholas and Alexandra and, and understand what happens uh, when you put troops in the streets against hungry people, it, it tends to backfire. But um, be that as may, I think the United States panicked. I think the United States is panicking. We are looking, we being America, our government is looking at Europe and understanding that we're losing control of the situation. That because of the sanctions, Europe is falling apart. Italy is peeling off. I mean, you know, Giorgino Molina, Molina, Molini, um, I can't pronounce her name, um, but she, uh, you know, she is, she, she's making some very bold statements about, um, about, you know, the future of the EU uh, and the role that Italy is going to play and not play. Um, and she's going to be under even more pressure to continue this kind of divorce from the EU as her economy is impacted by these sanctions and, and, and the energy. All of Europe is fun. Germany is very much at risk. And so the United States, I believe, decided to take Nord Stream 2 off the table, to remove it as an option for the German government, as a way of basically saying, Germany, you have no choice but to stay the course. We're not giving you an off-ramp. There is no off-ramp. One of the most short-sighted decisions ever made. If it turns out that the United States did this, I strongly believe they did, and it can be demonstrated the United States did this, we literally just lost Europe. We just lost Europe. Decades, eight decades of European US relations that have been developing since the end of the Second World War. Um, you know, and it's, it's a relationship that's totally one sided. I think anybody who studies it understands uh, what the G7, what the European Union, and what NATO are. They are extensions of American foreign and national security policy, they're tools of American policy. But there's a pretense of friendship, a pretense of an alliance there. Um, that pretense is going to be eliminated because Europe is going to wake up, and I believe Europe is already waking up to the reality that the United States doesn't care about Europe at all. None. Zero. Why else would we do this to the Germans, our ostensible allies? We blow up a $12 billion piece of infrastructure that is, even though it's majority owned by Gazprom, 49% of it's owned by a European conglomerate. Uh, it provides Germany's economic potential. 
we literally have condemned Germany to go from being Europe's number one economy to being on the bottom third. By the time this winter is done, Germany will have collapsed, will have collapsed. It will not be the power that it was, and it's not going to resurrect because where are they going to get their gas? From the United States that's going to sell them liquid natural gas at what price? Are we going to be good friends and sell it to them cheap? Are we going to match the Russian price? Or are we going to sit there and say, you know, this is good for American business. Pour it on, baby. Charge them triple. Charge them the going rate. Don't blame us. It's the market. Um, no, I, the United States has been exposed. And, and this is, I think, the consequence of this. This is going to go down in history as one of those pivotal moments where the basically the veil was ripped from the eyes of Europe. And they suddenly realized that person they thought was a friend wasn't. Actually, worse than that, they were an enemy, and they've been an enemy all along. Yeah, yeah, I got to agree. You know, as I said, I'm, I'm in Britain now. I've been in here for the last few months. I'll be coming back to the United States next week, a few days, actually. Um, and it, it's, it's amazing to watch the destruction of the British economy here. In fact, I wrote a long piece about it on my Facebook page, if folks want to go there and, and take a look. Um, but uh, uh, the prices for energy, um, if they let the market determine what it was, it would be about five times as high as it was last year. So they put a cap on it. And the cap is just for six months, then they're going to take it off, or they're going to have to make it some other kind of cap. But the cap still caps it at two and a half times what the energy costs were last year. This is at the same time that there's rampant inflation. I mean, if you um, uh, if you sanction a country that provides a lot of the uh, energy for uh, Europe, um, energy prices go up. If you sanction a country that provides a lot of the grain and food and fertilizer, uh, food prices go up. And not just that, when energy goes up, transportation goes up, the cost for industry goes up, they're less competitive. So there's a recession at the same time. In Britain right now, there is a recession and so, plus there's double digit inflation. And people are seriously worried about how they're gonna get through the winter. Are they gonna be able to heat? Are they gonna be able to eat? What are they gonna be able to do? I was listening today about a story about kids who are staying out of school. Part of the reason that they mentioned was that they can't afford the bus fare to get to school. Um, I mean, <laughs> the economy is going in bad, a terrible way. And what does Liz Trust do in the conservative government here? They give tax breaks, which grace, greatly favor the rich. And how are they going to pay for the tax breaks? Some people said, well, you should tax the windfall profits of the energy companies because they're making windfall profits. And so are also the, the um, military companies. They're making windfall profits. You should tax the windfall profits to pay for it. But they say, of course, no, they're borrowing money. And the IMF looked at what's going on and saying, well, how are you going to pay, pay this back? You don't have a scheme to do it. And the IMF publicly criticize them. They never publicly criticize an advanced capitalist country. They publicize the global, they criticize the global south. And as a result, the pound went way down um, compared to the dollar. And since the dollar is used for trade and the dollar is used for especially for trade and energy, it means all of that goes higher and inflation goes, goes higher. So they're in a terrible situation right here. And it's no different than in other places. You're talking about Germany and, and other places. We're going to see the same kind of thing. How they're going to get out of it, I don't know. Um, they believe somehow they're going to continue to sanction Russia, and that's going to cause Russia to collapse, and everything is going to go their way. But they now have destroyed the pipeline that could give them the gas that they need. So I think uh, there's a... Uh, 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 very bad situation that people are going to see in the next several months and how that's all going to work out politically in terms of the imperialist role of the United States, especially with uh, China growing um, to a bigger economy, perhaps even bigger than the United States, with Russia, the largest landmass in the world, with a lot of resources, minerals. What is going to happen? And, and Russia is turning its back now to the West because of these attacks. 
and is looking towards, towards the east. So we're going to see uh, a difficult time for the people in the west, including ourselves, I think. And but we're going to get through this period somehow, and hopefully we'll see a, a world with a weakened um, imperialist US. And that, I think, will be in the long run be better for everyone. Uh, I forgot to really give you a good um, introduction in the beginning, but as people do know, you you did speak the truth during the Iraq war as your uh, weapons inspector and, and said we did not find any weapons of mass destruction, which was used as the excuse for that war, which may have killed 1.5 million people in Iraq and caused uh, two-fifths of the country to become refugees. Um, and again, once again, you're speaking out and doing that, and you're an author. You've written a lot, and you're saying that some of your writing is being taken away from you because of your accusation. But what I forgot to mention is you have a new book um, <laughs> called Disarmament in the Time of Perestro Perestroika, Arms Control, um, uh, and the End of the Soviet Union. Do you want to just let people know where they can get that book before we end the video? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, the, the book is published by Clarity Press, so you can go to the Clarity Press website and uh, and get it. You can get it from Barnes and Nobles. You can get it from Amazon. But you know what? If you're in the Albany area or anywhere, go to your local bookstore and ask for the book. Um, you know, that's the best way because because of who I am and, and all that, the book isn't getting the same kind of, um, you know, support from the uh, distributor. The book's in the warehouses. Uh, but to get them on the bookshelf, you got to ask for them to be put on the bookshelf. So if you want to support uh, a writer, um, and this is a very important book about uh, arms control that isn't just a piece of history about the past, the INF Treaty. It's a template for success in the future because arms control, I believe, is going to be the only way that repairs relations between Russia and the United States and the, you know, provides a, a potential diplomatic off-ramp. So this is a template of success. Thank you. I'd like to... Thank everybody for joining us tonight. I hope um, you heard some things that will help you um, in your fight against war um, and to bring about a better world. That's what we in UNAC try to do. Um, I really want to thank Scott again. Every time I listen to him, uh, I, it's pretty amazing. <laughs>